Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, my name is Clarence White, and I have the privilege of working here. I also have the privilege of um, sort of, uh, out of, I don't know what we call it, grace or necessity or whatever, I, I get to uh, be an instructor for brown body skating lessons, which for me was just an excuse to get on the ice because working can find free ice time. Um, it's not free, but it is to me. Um, so uh, I uh, get to enjoy doing that. Um, but also I get to work here, so we're glad you're here at the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, if you haven't been here before especially, but if you're here today, we hope that you have signed in our, to our guest book, um, which is by the entryway there. So if you have not, we'd love it if you did. We would like to include you into more of our conversations. We have way too many events going on here, at least way too many for people not to come and join the conversation. This space is a nexus for a lot of really important cultural, artistic, uh, and community conversations. Uh, we also have a lot of flyers on the desk there. There are things coming up this week, things coming up next week, things coming up the week after that. Um, I couldn't count how many, and I will have to take a look after we're done to see which ones are coming next. Uh, but we would appreciate it if you joined us more often, um, and uh, I think really join other conversations, but to continue this conversation as well. Um, a few housekeeping things besides signing in uh, to the guest book. Uh, the restrooms are downstairs, so stairs or elevator, and um, there is that. Uh, and this event is being live streamed. Thank you, Carla, for once again helping us with that. So uh, you can um, revisit this uh, on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube page later on um, if there was something especially juicy that you heard. Um, as Peter likes to say, if you were part of the Witness Protection Program and can't be photographed, then let us know and we'll make sure that... <laughs> um, these guys have signed a release. So they're sort of stuck. Um, I'm going to start off uh, from a note that was um, sent to us, or a letter that was sent to us by our mayor, Melvin Carter, MC3, I like to call him. Um, and it goes like this. It's dated April 17th, and it goes, Dear friends, as mayor of St. Paul, and on behalf of the city of St. Paul, I want to thank you for your tremendous work at Brown Body with Tracing Steps and the surrounding community performances and conversations. Your body of work prompts much needed engagement and reflection on the issue of equity from audiences and gives invaluable meaning to the representation for black narratives, performers, and skaters. The responsibility to engage, empower, and uplift one another belongs to all of us. And it is an honor to be your teammate here in St. Paul. I trust that your production, performances, and conversations will promote a rich exchange of experiences and lead to greater accessibility, equity, and representation on the ice. We are an exciting, at an exciting time in St. Paul's history, and it brings me great joy that you are joining the tree, joining the tree rink as one of our equity on ice organizations. I can't wait to officially welcome you and meet you in the future community efforts. I am inspired by the powerful impact you are making to break barriers on ice for our community. For all, for all the ways you uphold our communities, thank you. Sincerely, Melvin Carter, Mayor. And uh, one of the significances uh, of having his voice in this conversation is, well, uh, as my son says, my mayor is black, uh, but he was also a hockey player. Um, and uh, I think maybe because he's younger, he does crazy things like try the crash ice uh, <laughs> course, which I would not 
do? You know, I, I don't get it. What's the purpose? I, someone does. Uh, so uh, it, it's great to have that voice as, as a part of this. Um, uh, I'm going to go on. Um, I, I think I said my name is Clarence White. I am a former hockey player a long time ago. I spent a little more than a decade of my life playing hockey. I started out um, playing hockey with figure skates and gloves that barely worked uh, and other equipment that was purchased from uh, uh, a lumber supply overstock store because my parents uh, assumed that I would quit after two weeks. Um, and I wasn't very good. Um, and it wasn't until much later that uh, I was the person that got volunteered to be a goalie. I know there's at least one other goalie in the crowd tonight. Um, and that's where I learned how to skate. And I got to be a better skater because goalies have to be better skaters. Not necessarily very fast. I was never a fast skater, but I'm a decent skater now for a person who really doesn't need to skate. Um, we have a, a great panel of artists, skaters, athletes here, um, and we're really grateful they're here. And I'm just going to introduce everyone and try and pronounce everyone's name properly. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go through the bios because I think they will tell you enough of their story as it is. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, introducing the brown body, body skaters. Um, I'm going to start with Janine Richburg, who is the artistic director of Brown Body. Um, I want to try and do this in some kind of order so I don't miss anyone because there are a lot of people on the stage. Uh, yes, uh, Corley, Corley Lovett Jr. And if you can raise your hand so we can sort of keep track. <laughs> uh, Raya Thurston Gerber. Lajene McMillan, and Stephen Smith. And then we have two other folks um, from, oh, sorry, I need to use this. Uh, from La Patin Libre is, I spent so much time practicing this. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now my mouth is doing different things than it was doing when it didn't have the pressure. Um, he's very gracious and it allows my American English speaking mouth to do its best with this. Summer right, summer right. <laughs> I just went so far. Summer right, boss. Um, and from the Minnesota Wild, uh, J.T. Brown. So, uh, what did I do? Oh, you know what? Because you're at the top and I started with the team. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Michelle. Um, now I have to redo this again in my head, too. Uh, so also with Brown Body, uh, Ruth Gebremenden. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, I just can't be fine. So thank you all for being here, and I really look forward to this conversation because it intersects with a, a very important part of my life. And we're going to start with Deneen, who is like a class and needs to behave. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, you'll need to turn that on. So. All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for um, coming. This is um, it's really gratifying um, to even be able to do this and have this conversation. Uh, growing up, these conversations didn't happen for me. Um, and I skated in, in spaces that were predominantly white, and even to acknowledge the fact that I felt different, and um, that the spaces, I felt different because of the spaces that I found myself in um, was, was significant and something that I just, it was not, um, it was not encouraged. Um, there were, I remember there were moments when I, I would bring up, I remember having a conversation in the locker room with another skater, and I remember I, I just, out of nowhere, I said, you know, my life, 
as a black skater is different, or my experience as a black skater is different than your experience as a white skater. And um, I remember getting, um, uh, I guess, reprimanded, so to speak, um, because how dare I, number one, bring up the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm different than everybody else and the fact that everybody else had a certain level of privilege. Um, and so, so to be able to speak openly about this is, is significant to me. So uh, real quick, I'm Deneen Richburg, founder and artistic director of Brown Body. Um, Brown Body, we are a nonprofit performing arts repertory company and um, we are very much interested in presenting uh, artistic work that offers very honest and nuanced narratives around blackness on and off the ice. Um, in addition to presenting artistic work, uh, we were very fortunate to hold donation-based Learn to Skate lessons um, to every Tuesday, so tomorrow, Tria Rank, 6 to 8. Um, sorry, just had to put in that little plug. Um, and uh, we'll also be presenting Tracing Sacred Steps uh, through a co-presentation with the Walker Arts Center in Northrop um, this Thursday and on Saturday. Um, uh, Thursday is at 4 o'clock and Saturday is at 5 o'clock. So um, uh, definitely all the information you can find on the Walker website as well as Brown Body's website, brownbody.org. All right, did my, did my, my due diligence. Um, I just, uh, you know, uh, this, having this opportunity to, to talk about these things, as I mentioned, is, is very therapeutic for me. Um, and so, one thing that has always uh, been a challenge growing up in skating is I, I don't have the traditional skating body. You know, I have hips, I have thighs, I have butt. Um, and it was, I, I consistently was defined, my figure was consistently defined as being overweight. Um, and in, in skating spaces, of course, you know, that's, that's like the carnal sin. Don't try and be a competitive figure skater and, and be overweight. That's like, you know, you just, just go and be a, a quote unquote recreational skater then. And so um, I felt like I always had to um, be twice as good or, or just really strongly prove that I, I deserved to be in the spaces that I was in. Um, and, and so I always put a lot of pressure on myself, like, oh my gosh, I gotta get my double axel, gotta get my triple style, gotta get, gotta get these jumps so that I can be perceived as valid and, and as belonging in these spaces. Um, and and it's, it felt like no matter how hard I tried, um, I just could not change people's perceptions of me. Um, and I, I remember uh, in 1998, ooh, I'm dating myself, uh, the world championships were, were brought to the Twin Cities and uh, they gathered pretty much every advanced level skater and invited them to participate in the opening and closing ceremonies. And they literally, and if I, at that time I, I passed all of my tests. I was senior gold, um, I had my gold in, in, in freestyle, uh, ice dance, and moves in the field. I'll catch me afterwards and I can explain more about what, what all that means. Um, and so I, I, all my peers, all of the, the people that I was competing against, they were all invited and I was just waiting for my invitation. I was waiting, waiting, waiting. All of a sudden rehearsals for the open and closing, opening and closing ceremonies were happening and they happened to be happening in the rink that I was training in. I was like, wait a second, I never got my invitation. Like, what's, what's up? And so I remember going up to one of the organizers and I said, well, you know, I love to skate in the opening and closing ceremonies, why can't I skate? And she said, and I was a teenager at the time, and she said, she looked me dead in the eye, I remember this, and she said, you just don't have the right look. And, and I, I think about that, oh my gosh, why am I getting emotional? Woo, sorry. I'm way too old to be getting emotional. I, I still carry this with me, obviously. But I think about that and I'm like, first of all, why is an adult talking to a, a teenager or child that way? And second of all, why are you complete? I, I guess a, a production company was organizing the um, opening and closing ceremony and I'm like, why would the production company essentially set these standards? And I'm like, why would you be complicit in this blatantly racist act of excluding certain people from this experience? Um, you, you know what's wrong. So, sorry, I'm getting all emotional. I didn't think that was gonna happen. 
Um, I've told the story before and that has never happened. But um, so just, you know, so, so that experiences like that and really shifting and changing what it means to be on the ice um, that is really uh, one of the, the primary reasons why I opted to establish Brown Body. I was like, okay, the ice does not have to be this kind of narrowly focused, you know, tiny, tiny, little skinny um, white girls in, you know, pink dresses with sparkly sequins. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be used um, for, you know, a, a, the, a, a, it can be used to help communicate very rich multi-dimensional, complex stories of ev any and everybody's uh, cultural experience. And so I'm like, I really need to, to bust this space open. Um, and so I was, I, I was competitive for you know about 20 years, ended up injuring my knee. And um, after, that was actually a blessing in disguise. I would have, look, I'd still be trying to compete now if it happened. <laughs> I know, I know, I, I probably wouldn't. I'd be like, I'm tired. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and so I had the opportunity to work with Penumbra Theater Company and Pangea World Theater Company and to learn from the artistic directors of both of those companies. And then I had the wonderful opportunity to actually get my MFA in dance and choreography from Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, lived in, in Philly, North Philly for like 10 okay. years, it was amazing. Okay. I was immersed in a sea of beautiful blackness and it totally changed the way that I understood and perceived myself. And that was like, okay, I need, to, I need to reclaim the ice. I need to at least reclaim the experience of being on the ice for myself. And so that's, um, hence Brown Body. Brown Body was born, so. So yeah, that's my, I'm sure I went well over my five to seven minute allotment, but I'm gonna hand the mic over to, oh, did we determine the order? This is fine. All right. So the elders. The season. The seasons? The seasons. Yeah, yes, that's a good idea. Yes. Now what? Where do I begin? Where did you begin? Where did I begin? Hmm. Well, let's see. I started skating at the age of 10. Um, the only reason why I started skating is a family friend, and my parents worked at the same hospital, and there was a coworker. She would always brag about her son, saying he was going to Olympics, he was so amazing. <laughs> oh my God, he's so good, he's so good, he's so good. And she would always bring his third place medals in, <laughs> and the average person doesn't know what a, a bronze medal looks like and what a gold medal looks like. So she would bring his medals in and say he won, he's going to Olympics, he's amazing. And so she would just always brag about him to my um, parents. And then finally there's a local competition and she said, you should invite your son. So um, my dad brought me to the competition and I was like, that is so cool. I was like, I could do that. So I tried it out and I've been skating ever since. And I don't, my story growing up and all that stuff, but about competing and all that stuff. I had a pretty amazing upbringing and Skating was amazing for me, and I had a lot of opportunities. I don't have anything like that, well, you know. But you, um, you have your, your experience. I've had my experiences, um, but it mainly wasn't when I was competing. It was when I turned professional, and um, you know, I did toured with Disney, and I've done a lot of other shows and stuff. Um, I don't know where to begin with those. Um, <laughs> Because at first, I mean, things were happening, but I still love to skate, so that really wasn't like the deal breaker. Like, I can get through this because I'm still doing what I love. I still get to do this. And whatever, it's not that bad. I'm still doing what I love. So um, I just kept on going. Like, it really didn't bother me, really didn't affect me because, you know, with skating, I was, that kind of pretty much defined me. And I knew I was good, and you couldn't take that away from me. So those things were minuscule, so I really didn't have a problem with that. I mean, if I had told the story to other people, like, I can't believe you put up with that. I would have left out quit, but I just did. Um, it wasn't until I retired and um, I wanted to get back into skating. Boy, too many stories now to think about it. Um, and the one in particular stands out because um, I retired and I wanted to skate again. And um, a friend got me this job at um, SeaWorld. 
And um, it's, you know, it's a big corporation, it's a big thing. And um, they're like, we need a resume. I'm yeah. pretty seasoned. <laughs> I don't even know what those are like. I haven't had to do that. So, okay, resume. And the producers knew who I was. So I had to do that. And it goes through corporate. That's how the hiring goes. And then they said, um, we need to show, you need to send in a video. I was like, okay. So I sent one video. And when you do shows, you're not skating as yourself. You're either skating as a character or, a, you know, it's a, a theme. And I sent him one video and they're like, that's too much of a character. Okay, so I sent him another video. And they're like, well, that one's really old. Okay, send him another video. Then I said, we need a headshot. And so the basic actor, like protocol, we sent a black and white headshot. Then they called me again and they're like, we need a colored one. Mm. <laughs> That's when the red flag, the one I ignored, but the red flag went up. And I was like, well, why? Because they can't tell what shade of black I am? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I went anyway, because I wanted to see. And um, so I was excited, and I've gone through some stuff, and I was just wanted to skate, because that's what m makes me happy. So I got the rehearsals, oh, did get through, go back. First day, first day. Um, principal is, and I'm skating, and it's in this outdoor theater, and all the officials are in the stands watching me, because I had just replaced a, another skater, which is white. They were all watching me the whole time. That doesn't happen ever, mm -hmm. ever. All the higher up executives just they were watching me, mm -hmm. to the point where they, someone left and went and searched the park for the one black employee to go, oh my God, there's a black skater, you have to go see him. There's one, he's out there. So, he came, and I didn't even meet him, he just waved at me. Um, <laughs> fast, fast, uh, fast forward, um, the last run through the show, the day before opening night, I, heard, um, I was tired and I hurt my back. I pinched a nerve in my back and I could barely walk. And they were just like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I was like, don't worry, you're gonna get a show. I'm not gonna be able to do all the jump, but you're gonna get a show. Don't worry. So I went out there and it hurt so bad, but I pushed through it and I pushed through it. And um, fast forward again. I was injuring, I wanted to skate so bad, I injured myself every single day. But here's the thing. I know with anybody else, this is definitely what happened. Those executives came to see every single show and if they all weren't there, they would, they would send someone to see what I was doing. And I know that would never ever happen. I couldn't get up when I got up ice and I would like, you like this? I couldn't do that. They would call the producer and the producer would call and say, what's wrong? If I like was limping in the hallways, I would get a, they would get a phone call and someone would ask me and they would just pull me in a room saying, what's wrong? We, we, we need to replace you if you don't get better. And I was like, this is really weird. I was like, oh my, but I still wanted to skate. So I'm injuring myself more and more and more and more. They're like, you need your jumps by Thursday. They sent me to um, physical therapy and all that stuff. They're like, well, you need all your jumps on the Thursday. I was like, you know it's a back injury. It doesn't just heal itself by Thursday. But I still injured, but I still put all my jumps back in. Didn't say a word. And there, I know that would never happen with anybody else. And I just, that's when I was like, this is effed up. <laughs> and, you know, and I came back to skating to feel better about myself, yet the things they were throwing at me were completely just wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Because I know they would have done that with me. There's more of that story, I'm just leaving a bunch of stuff out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Come on, this lodge. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Rajane, and um, I guess my skating journey is um, a lot different than um, most people on the panel. So um, I grew up skating, I started when I was nine, um, and I quit after high school to go to college. 
Um, and basically, I went to school for digital media. So um, there, uh, well, actually, I'll take a few steps back. In high school, I was really interested in robotics um, as well as, uh, so I, I started like a robotics club, so I would like go skating and then, you know, also have my club. And um, after I quit skating, um, I played like different sports like soccer and lacrosse and just to like stay in shape. And then, um, and then I went to college for digital media. So I was interested in technology. Actually, wait up. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I went to school for mechanical engineering first. So um, I would go to school um, at NYU, and um, the first uh, semester was pretty much the semester where I realized I was like, heck no, I don't want to be a mechanical engineer. Um, I didn't really like, I didn't enjoy the classes, and I didn't really enjoy like being in school from like, like all I would see was just like pitch dark. Like I'd go in and be like dark outside, like go home and be dark outside. So I was like, no. So then I switched my major to digital media because I was interested in um, how I could basically create with technology, um, but in more um, um, creative ways. So um, there I was able to learn about um, projection mapping, um, physical computing, um, audio, um, video, um, but also one of the things that really latched on to me was motion capture. So um, I started, I took this class called Bodies of Motion, and basically um, what we did in that class was we worked with dancers and we used their motion capture data to create these performances real in real time. So the idea is that um, the dancer wears this motion capture suit, um, which is um, basically like what they use in movies to create animations for characters. So um, I was honestly just like mind blown by the experience. Um, that project ended up uh, basically touring um, around uh, New York and New Jersey. Um, so yeah, so we showed that many venues, including like Lincoln Center. Um, it, was, it was really um, interesting. Um, and then I, from there, got into motion capture and animation. So um, mainly I began to do um, animation for virtual reality experiences. So um, one of the experiences that uh, I was able to work on got into Sundance and toured to like Tribeca and all around. Um, then I have another project that I just worked on um, that's going to Tribeca um, next week, so um, that's really cool. And then, um, but <laughs> now, um, as I've gone through like my art career, I sort of hit a point where um, I wanted to work on my own projects and projects that meant something to me. So um, right now, I basically came up with this idea to um, work with primarily, um, actually only like black uh, performance artists. Um, so one of the problems in motion capture and technology and all technolo technolo technological fields um, is that they're um, a majority um, white. And um, basically uh, when you're making in those spaces or when you, when you don't have access to tools, like not everyone has access to a motion capture studio, um, and you want to create projects, like virtual reality projects, you have access to libraries, um, to motion capture libraries. However, you don't know where that data is, is coming from. Um, you don't know anything about this, the person who's wearing the suit. Um, and for me, who wants to make projects about black people, I don't feel comfortable using motion capture data where I don't know where it came from, I don't know who the person is. So um, I had this idea that I would create a library of black movement. So basically, um, the idea is to work with uh, primarily black performers, well, all black performers, and basically um, learn about their lives, give them like in-depth interviews, um, learn about their movement practices, um, and learn about their journeys, like everything that they've gone through, um, and then also, um, with that, create these sort of um, 
performances and virtual reality experiences as well that link to it. So um, the idea is that I work with, um, I just worked with two different performance artists. One of them, um, he, uh, he uh, trained with Alvin Ailey for 10 years. Um, but then the other performer, he um, was a young student from um, NYU um, uh, Clive Davis School. So he does a lot of mu music production, but he grew up dancing. So um, I interviewed them, and then I created these visuals um, using um, a 3D animation um, um, software. And uh, basically, they performed to their interviews. Um, and you got to learn about them and learn about their practice, um, as well as see them move as well. So that's, so that in itself, I guess, is like my next uh, step, is basically just um, creating all of these um, experiences for people to um, see. And I realized that it was more than just a library for people to use, but um, I really became interested in this idea of building an archive. Um, so I feel like there are so many different times where um, black movement is exploited or um, it's, uh, it's, just, it's basically just used and nobody really cares about the historical background. Um, uh, has any, anyone heard about the Fortnite um, incident that, that recently happened? So that's all motion capture, right? And they're just applying it to characters and they're basically um, stealing movements from from um, from all of these like black artists um, and from all of these communities. So you take away the cultural relevance, you take away all of those things and I think it's wrong. So um, I want to basically build a space that protects those movements and um, that honors our movement. Um, so that's what sort of brought me here to Brown Body um, because I realized that as I create this library, I have to basically try to understand my relationship to my body. Um, it's one thing for me to just you know, do all the tech stuff, um, but it's another thing for me to really understand how my body moves in a space. So I reached out to Denise and, and I sent her a really long email. And I was just like, hey, I grew up skating and now I'm doing all this tech stuff and now I really want to merge this, merge the two and um, redefine my relationship to um, the ice because um, that's where I guess like I grew up learning how to move, um, but also like off the ice as well. So I really want to understand like how to. Um, I I think like with the ice when it comes to the ice, it's very much like um, for me like I guess like uh, space wise like it's it draws a lot of connections to me for like with the tech technology space. Um, because I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm just like, why? I keep picking things and like, I'm just like, I keep picking the weirdest stuff to do. So, <laughs> um, um, I want to like really look at those parallels. I want to understand like why I chose these different fields. Um, and I want to basically, um, yeah, I just want to, I want to move and make stuff. So yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name is uh, Samori, I'm from France, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brown Body for the invitation. Uh, oh, thanks, it's really my pleasure, it's uh, very interesting to meet interesting people, sportive performer, artists. It's a big premiere for me, I've never done this kind of talk, and I think it's really good, it's happening. Um, so, I am, uh, I'm a figure skater, uh, formerly. I grew up in France and I started skating when I was quite young, seven years old. And uh, in France, it's a bit of a different system in the US as for how the sport is organized. So we have a socialist uh, way of organization and you have a capitalist way of organization. Uh, I, if, I, if I grew up in the US, I would never have been a skater because it's way too expensive. Uh, in France, we neutralize, like, you have one coach for many kids, so we make it more affordable to, let's say, a broader amount of the middle class to have access to this yeah. formerly aristocratic and then uh, bourgeois uh, <laughs> sport. Because it's really, you know, it came from England, it was uh, for aristocracy at the beginning, then after the bourgeoisie, and then uh, it was quite uh, elitist, and it's still very elitist, and it has a lot of norms. 
And uh, if you don't fit the norms, then your life is going to be completed in the skating world, in the competitive skating world. So um, I hear a lot of things with color. And uh, for me in France, what I noticed was not so much about the color. It's what, it was just about figure skating as a very conservative medium, the sport itself. Uh, I saw discrimination, financial discrimination, body discrimination, style discrimination, like your taste, what kind of music you take, what kind of costume you have. And um, so I grew up doing competitions for about 10 years at high level, representing France nationally and internationally. Uh, and then I didn't want it to compete anymore. Uh, so I went into doing traditional skating shows, you know, big ice shows like Disney on Ice or Holiday on Ice, like Ice Capades, you know, in the US you have that sound on Ice. And um, so from competition, it was a lot of norm and lots of discrimination on any basis. And in the shows, it was a kind of aesthetic that was always repeating. It was always about popular entertainment. And there was never anything that made me vibrate about it. When I look at theater, dance, yeah. uh, music, architecture, I saw so many different alternative currents. And in skating, it was always the same aesthetic. The same things we were like, keep pushing. So I wanted to do something else. And uh, it didn't exist at the time. So I was in these big companies, bored, really wanted to try something new. And then I, I, uh, I check online, like on YouTube, like videos of companies that uh, were starting to do new stuff, at least like skaters trying to innovate with skating. A little bit, as you say, like try to propose something out of the norm. It doesn't have to be competition. It doesn't have to be popular entertainment. It can be something different. And I was interested into art and making exploration with movement on ice. So I found online a company called Le Patin Libre, just a bunch of uh, skaters from Quebec that had exactly the same background as me, competition, traditional shows, wanted to get away from it and create something new. And I contacted them and I joined the company uh, like about eight years ago. And together now we fully dedicated to the creation of a new skating style, a contemporary approach of skating, out of norms out of willing to win a gold medal, out of willing to sell tickets with like impressive tricks, really something more artistic. Uh, so yeah, that's why I'm, I'm here today. We're going to be presented by the Worker Art Center in Two Ice Rings, uh, in uh, conjunction with Brown Body. So it's, it's really a, a, a pleasure. Why? Why? And uh, I would not advise any kid to go into competitive figure skating. Uh, <laughs> But online, like, for me today, the, 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 my issue, and my point is that uh, I will not encourage any people from like African-American or any other ethnic to go into that just because by itself, competitive figure skating at a high level, for me, in my opinion, is not a good environment. It's rather negative than positive. And I know we have all different backgrounds and it'll be interesting also to to share the stories because we don't have the same relation to skating. But my relation, what I, what I notice is that it's a very narrow-minded world. You gotta fit the norms. Uh, it's very conservative and it's not uh, a good place to emancipate yourself as a human being. Creatively, um, artistically, you know, we have different bodies. I was tall, I'm still tall and skinny. Uh, this didn't play my favor in competition. Not because I was not good, but just as an aesthetic, you know. Uh, in shows as well, I was never principal because the principal has to be rather a, a short man, rather muscular. Uh, maybe it changed now, but in my days it was really uh, it was really it. So I got away from this and created something on my own with my colleagues, like uh, from from Le Patalim. and it's much um, more gratifying and uh, positive uh, for me. And I think uh, we really want to inspire other people to do that. Uh, so we do a lot of cultural outreach activity when it's not about performance. It's not about like how good you're going to be, how, how beautiful you're going to look. It's just going to be about, man, it's just you, your body, your mind, your soul, and exploring movement, like uh, discovering new things, you know, new way of movement. And I think there's a real opportunity uh, in the US, hopefully, in France, it's happening already in Europe, to, to orient um, practice of skating in a different way. So for me, it's not how can we integrate more people to competitive figure skating, you know, from different colors, different ethnicities. It's just, I'm questioning the, <laughs> the world itself of contemporary, of, uh, of uh, competitive skating. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's really joining, like, what you're trying to propose, something just an alternative, something different, yeah. So, yeah.
Okay, baby, we got another one right here. Hello. You're it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm from a different generation, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> I'm not as seasoned. I love my seasoned folks. Um, so I'm going to give you a little up-to-date on my life right now. <laughs> so, um, my name is Corley Lovett Jr. I'm originally from Texas. Um, <laughs> come on now, I've got my Beyonce. So, I'm originally from Texas. Um, I grew up in a very competitive family. So, I played any sports you name, I can do. So I played football, basketball, tennis, track, and most of them was family sports. So I've always been competitive with my family members. Um, and then, um, I think 90% of skating is mental. I think that for any sport because um, if you have no fear, then you're gonna try it. So for me, I've been dancing for 18 years as a ballet dancer. Five years professionally, um, I moved to New York when I was 16 to join a ballet company, a couple of companies actually. And then um, I was a gymnast for 10 years. Um, when I was about 15, I had to make a decision if I wanted to um, do gymnastics or be a ballet dancer. And gymnastics is just too dang hard. <laughs> so I chose to be a ballet dancer. Um, and uh, at 19, I started figure skating. I'm 24 now, so I've been skating for five years. Um, I am a competitive skater now. This would be my first season as a senior man. Yay for me. <laughs> um, okay, so, the only thing that I've noticed from each sport in particular for being black is definitely typecast. Um, I've been cut from auditions because I was black. Not just saying I was the only one cut. They cut all the black people. I mean, just let us all out. And. I think in this world, I was taught at a young age that you got to be strong mentally. So that never like phased me. Um, when I go into an ice rink, it's always like, ooh, what he gonna do? Because that's just how it is. You know, we're, you can see us. We're like the only one on the ice. So it's like, um, when I walk on the ice sometimes, especially when I first started, oh my God, they'd be like, and they would just look at me, and I was, I was bad. I mean, I was bad, like I was falling everywhere. And they'd be like, what is he trying to do? Okay, we gonna press play to now, honey. I show up at their wings, they'd be like, we ain't seen him in a while, hmm. <laughs> so now, this queen has all her triples, I have all my jumps, um, all the jumps that Skater's been working so hard to get, now I am a little, cocky about it because I did the work, baby. So, I'm gonna be cocky about it, period, okay? Cause some of these girls, they be like, when I first started skating, this one girl, I don't, I remember this chick, ooh. I remember this chick. By the way, I got into skating because I quit the ballet company, it's a long story, but y'all can ask me about it later. Um, I was on the ice, you know, I was trying to do a little double flip I watched, see, I learned from watching, so I watched it on YouTube. So whatever they did, I did it. So this girl will come up to me and go, what are you doing? You are never going to get that looking like that. You ain't going to never get anything. I looked at that girl, I said, girl, give me a couple of years, baby. Hmm. I seen her a couple of months ago. She's still working on that single axle. <laughs> baby, I done surpassed you. So... Never give up is my always thing. Um, you have to be mentally strong. Um, I did little competitions here and there, you know, those little ones that don't count. But um, it is definitely different from y'all generation to my generation. Our generation is a little bit more accepting of, you know, ethnicity. While I'm on the ice now, this is the gag. They like you if you're good. That's the gag in this skating world. I mean, that's in any art form. I mean. Dancers, same thing. If you ain't good, baby, they ain't gonna pay no mind to you in that level of professionalism, you know? So I think not just skating, if you wanna put your kids in anything, football. You know how many black football people there are? 
Okay, they're gonna be like, if you ain't good, they ain't gonna look at you. People like to be friends with the people that are good. That's just how it is in anything. So for me, um, gymnastics on the other hand, they like, where are the black people? Cause you know, we, they think Simone Biles, they go, ooh, he about to do something big. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, um, I went on the high bar a couple of weeks ago, just to like, I do conditioning still, I don't go to the gym. I just do gymnastics conditioning because it's better for you. And I get on the high bar and I just start swinging. And everybody go, what are you about to do? I surely did fall right off. I flew off the bar, landed on my stomach, landed on the bar, popped off, got back up. They was like, oh. <laughs> so, um, I guess, you know, that's gonna be prejudice and all that with anything that you do. That's just how the life is. We're not gonna have the body structure. That's called good breeding, okay? You know, shade. Um, so, that being said, as a dancer, they always tell you, work with what you got. And baby, let me tell you, my, look, we all gonna look different in the era, but whatever you gotta do to get the job done, I'ma do it. So, I don't, I'm not mentally on that, like if somebody's like been racist or prejudiced, so I'm gonna be like, girl, you don't even know what I can do. Because they be like, I can do this. And I'd be like, well baby, I can do this, and this, and this, and this. What can you do? One thing, period. So, I'm not being cocky, guys. <laughs> Look for me on TV one day, okay? Um, that's all I gotta say. Little cute and short. Y'all know my name? Y'all gonna learn. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I'm over here. So, um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Ruth. Um, yeah, I have, I argue a bit of a different background too. Um, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, I started skating because um, my best friend in eighth grade was on a synchronized skating team. And I had tagged along to one of her competitions, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. You get to kind of perform with a group of girls, and I was just immediately obsessed with it. And it might have been because I also was really, like, admired my friend. She was really good at everything, and so I thought, okay, maybe I can you know, be better friends with her if I do this. I don't really know what was in my head, but... So yeah, I um, started skating when I was 14. Which, um, yeah, is a little older. I mean, you were, I think you were 19, you said? Yeah, you were named. Yeah, so yeah, you were yelling over me. But um, yeah, and it took uh, a lot of convincing of my parents. But my parents really liked this friend of mine. So she was like, all right, <laughs> good influence. We'll let you skate, I guess. Um, and my big goal was to just make it on to one of the synchronized skating teams in Milwaukee. Um, and uh, within four months of starting basic skating classes, I got onto their like basic beginner young team uh, team, um, and I was able to compete synchronized skating for, uh, all four years of high school. And then I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I got to compete with their collegiate and open collegiate synchronized skating team. Um, for those who don't know what synchronized skating is, basically it's uh, when you're with a team of about 16 people and you make formations on the ice. Um, it uh, has similar levels to what you would normally see in standard track uh, freestyle skating. Um, and once you get to the collegiate level or a, I think it's juvenile and above, you can uh, make it to nationals. So uh, my big goal throughout those eight years was just to make it to a team that was um, competing at, at, at the national level. It was kind of like, once you're there for synchronized skating, um, you've not made it, but kind of made it in, in, in that world. Um, and then um, you could potentially uh, be on, if you're on a senior team that gets top two in the nation, you can compete in, in the like world championship. Synchronized skating is not in the Olympics, so it's just your goals are, are a little different in that space. Um, so yeah, I was very focused on getting my moves passed, um, and uh, so I wasn't really like a freestyler or a jumper, but um, with synchronized skating, the big goal is um, to sort of look like one unit. Um, they had a really big emphasis on making sure that all the skaters looked the same, um, 
really specifically on like how you, you know, pointed your toes and how you performed and how you um, expressed yourself on the ice. Um, they wouldn't necessarily straight up say that you had to look a certain way, um, but I, as I got older, could feel that there was a standard in how they wanted us to look. Um, I remember, uh, and it wasn't really until actually my last year of synchronized skating that I kind of made the connection that um, I probably wasn't your ideal synchronized skater. Um, so in undergrad, I studied nutritional sciences and global health. And I was in a lot of public health courses. And um, yeah, to keep it short, I was in a social justice and, and health equity course. And uh, our final project was to sort of talk about um, kind of anything we learned, I think, in, in the class. And I decided to talk about or make a video on um, power, privilege, and opportunity within synchronized skating. And yeah, so that's a, a, a mouthful. But um, it gave me the space to really explore um, the different um, types of barriers that people experience in, in synchronized skating. Um, and a lot of what I guess I learned that I had experienced, kind of reflecting back on my eight years and doing it, was that, you know, just being someone of color, um, I would have to be the skater that would have the adjusted dress because the, the mesh needed to match my skin, or um, the coaches would pick out makeup for the girls, but then they put it on me and it wouldn't look as good, so I'd have to go and get my own types of things to match or whatever. And these are really basic little things. Um, but once I hit um, college, the level, of, it, it wasn't as easy to get onto these teams. And so um, I remember for like a year, there was um, a point in time where I uh, felt like I didn't make the national team potentially because of my race. Um, and it was just basically looking upon the girls who were rostered on the team. And I would, and me and my friends also were like, Ruth, you know, you're at that same skill level. I don't know why you weren't picked, but um, those girls were. Um, and there could have been a lot of factors, but um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you, to really say it shortly, I guess, um, when you're the one that sticks out, you kind of have to make sure you look especially good to blend in with that crowd. And so I think there was uh, extra pressure placed on me um, indirectly to be one of the higher level skaters on that team. Um, and so luckily I had some good friends and they were able to help me get on the team the following year. Um, and of course I'd get like comments like, uh, you know, you're Team Beyonce, or, or you're the, the like Team Beyonce, or you're the token black skater of Wisconsin, or you are, um, one coach called me the Synchro GPS, which kind of referred to the fact that in like, in like videos, she wouldn't be able to tell who everyone else was, but she could spot out me. And so she'd say, okay, who is like two down from Ruth? Like, and so, and like at the time, right, you'd laugh it off because it just, you know, it's awkward to point it out or be offended by it. Um, and you want that acceptance from other people. But looking back, I kind of thought, hmm, that doesn't really mean a lot. And it just would point out my blackness in that space. So um, after I graduated in 2016, I um, didn't really have a reason to continue synchronized skating. And I think it was a positive break for myself. Um, I started teaching learn to skate, I don't know, did some random things. Um, and then in 2017, I moved here for graduate school um, at the School of Public Health in, at the University of Minnesota. And I'm forgetting how exactly I figured out about brown body, but I think I like was Googling. I saw your, uh, the, uh, your project. Huh, yeah, so. And then I reached out to you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I had a, a project, so that health equity and social justice class I made that video and it, I put it on YouTube. Uh, I think it was just for the purpose of, of the class, but I think other people have been, yeah. <laughs> like, been able to see it. So we connected and I realized, wow, this would be a really great space to continue what I love. I mean, I love the performing part of it. I love creating things and communicating messages across the ice, but the, um, the, the pressure that it brought and the um, isolation that it brought um, obviously wasn't the best thing for me. And so, um, yeah, I mean, Deneen was really great. Uh, she was doing work that I think um, helped me to really love my whole self. And um, <coughs> the following year, I helped Deneen with a really small project. And um, now I'm teaching Learn to Skate with her broad body classes. And so it's been, um, yeah, a, a great way to sort of redefine skating um, without the, the negativity, I guess, that I had uh, previously experienced. But.
Hi, my name is Mariah. Um, I am from California, and um, I've been skating for about 21 years. I started when I was five years old, and um, I actually, my grandma took me to a rink. There's a rink up the hill, as we call it, in Lake Arrowhead. And um, my grandma took me to this rink, and I, I was watching skating, and I ran across the ice. And so she was like, oh, I need to put her in skating lessons. And it just so happened, they opened a rink near where I, was gonna, where I lived. And um, she signed me up for Learn to Skate, and I was really bad. <laughs> really, really bad. They used to call me Bambi, because I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. um, but I fell in love with the sport, and um, I continued on. And I was actually very lucky with my competitive career. Um, my skating coach is also black. And um, I think between her and my grandma, they kind of shielded me from a lot of the things that I probably would have experienced. And they kind of like, I didn't know if, for example, when I was competing, what group I was going to be in and all of that kind of stuff. And so it kind of shielded me a lot from maybe some of the things that I would have experienced. Also, I grew up um, kind of around a very diverse group um, of skaters. It just so happened, to, I was the only black skater, but it just so happened to be that it was diverse enough that it didn't, I didn't feel so much so that I stuck out. Um, so then, um, towards the end of my skating career, I was, I was uh, competitive for a while, and I won a regionals, um, I went to junior nationals, um, I went to sectionals, and actually my very last sectionals, I got fifth place. And I got fifth place um, to a girl who was less competitive than I was as far as skill. And so after that, my grandma was like, you know, maybe it's time for you to try something else. And I was devastated, and I was like, absolutely not. Like, I've been training my entire life for this. Um, and so it just so happened that she and my skating coach had linked up and signed me up for Disney on Ice without telling me. <laughs> so um, I actually auditioned two weeks before my high school graduation, and I got hired on the spot. And um, I was offered to go two weeks after as well um, to Mexico for six weeks. So I left, um, went on tour, and um, I fell in love with it. I got to um, portray the role of Princess Tiana for about six years, um, and that was cool. And then um, my fifth year, I met my husband, and um, he and I started skating together. And we started skating together because it just so happens that um, Disney has cut down a majority of the Tiana roles. And so the last principal Tiana role that was on Disney, I skated it. Um, maybe they'll bring it back, I don't know. But up until this point, that's still the case. Um, so they told me they're going to cut the role. And um, after six years, you know, you've been working for a company. It's kind of like, what do I do next? And so it just so happened that my husband also wanted to do um, cruise ships. So we actually um, worked really hard and neither of us were Adagio skaters um, and we got hired for Royal Caribbean after three months of skating together. Then we skated on ships for about two years and that was really wonderful. And then um, we got hired to work for Holiday on Ice, which is a European ice show company and you travel around Europe and I have Definitely got to say, like, as far as companies to work for and being appreciated for my skills and also just being appreciated um, when it comes to, like, having costumes made because obviously your mesh has to be different and your tights have to be different and everything has to be different. And, like, they were so willing to ask questions and to figure out what exactly I needed to feel comfortable on the ice, and they actually tore apart an entire costume for me that had light skin mesh and created a costume for me for finale so that I could feel comfortable. And so um, that is kind of my skating career experience. Um, I still do work for Holiday on Ice, um, and so I am here now uh, just for the couple of weeks and going through this whole experience. And uh, one of the things that kind of came up when we were kind of talking about being black in skating, um, something that I've experienced, um, one of them was actually when I was playing Princess Tiana, um, we had an understudy rotation. So 
The role was obviously mine to portray regularly, but during once they were trying to figure out who was going to be understudies, I looked around and I was like, but oh, wait, <laughs> who's going to be my understudy? Because you know, we have a cast of 30 and I don't see any other black girls. <laughs> and uh, so anyways, um, I quickly learned that that meant that it was not going to be someone black. And so for about six years, you know, I had a friend paint her entire skin. Um, and, you know, that was very difficult to watch because she'd be in the makeup room, uh, had to go in the last show of the day painting herself. And, I mean, I don't know, you can't get dark painting yourself. So she would look, you know, like she painted herself. <laughs> and uh, so that was something that I experienced. Um, and then when I was in Japan specifically, uh, this was maybe my, this was the very first time I experienced it. And I don't even... Um, no, I, I, I don't know. Anyways, uh, they had to pick an understudy, and we had 27 shows in 10 days. And the understudy that they picked was Japanese, from Japan. So you can, you know, imagine what that looks like. And not only that, they had us go into the number, and there were three, uh, six ensemble spots, but there were three very dark-skinned girls in the ensemble number, along with this Japanese girl that was portraying Tiana. So I naturally took a picture, because so I was like, I gotta make sure I remember this. So I had the picture, and occasionally I'll look at it, but it just reminds me of how, you know, for some people, they just don't understand. And for years, that was very hard for me to watch, especially if I was capable and able to skate the show. And to see, because when someone goes into your um, role, you watch. So it was very hard for me to see the reaction of the other little black girls who would come and they'd get all dressed up and they'd be so excited to see that character and they'd come out and you could just see the disappointment of not having someone who you thought was gonna look like you, look like you. So, um, yeah. Um, since then, I've you know kind of been able to move on and not necessarily have to do something so character based and so confining. And I think that for me was a really great step in a completely different direction and made me feel completely different about performing. So I'm grateful for that. Hello. All right. Uh, I'm J T Brown. I'm a forward for the Minnesota Wild. Um, I guess. My story started uh, with, I just wanted to play hockey because all of my friends did. Um, I was uh, the only one of my friends group that was uh, black, but I also didn't want to be left out. So at the same time, we were on the same baseball teams, basketball teams, football teams. And for me, when they went to play hockey, I wasn't going to be left out. So that's kind of how I started playing. Obviously, being in Minnesota, it's a lot easier to start playing hockey. So I think that had a lot to do with it for me being able to just go out on the ponds you know in the winter and just skate that's what we would do every day after school um, for myself i think the hardest part is just being around a group of people that you're very good friends with but none of them have the exact same experiences that you have um, i think hockey is a very great sport but it's also a sport that doesn't I wouldn't say it celebrates individuality, where if you look at football, you know, they can paint their cleats and they can show themselves that way. Or basketball, you can choose what you wear, uh, whether it's a headband, or you can kind of change your style to what you want. But hockey is a very team-oriented, and if it's anything outside of the team, I guess you don't necessarily want to hear it. I mean, if you've ever listened to hockey players give an interview, uh, I'm pretty sure they have 10 answers for the exact same questions that they can use at any point in time. So. That just kind of gives you to the part of like there really is no individuality in hockey so i think that's kind of the the biggest part and the challenge is knowing that you are different and that you have a individual side and where and how are you able to let that out um i think that's a challenge for a lot of people but you know for myself i just try to just be as true as i can you know for myself and i think for my story it's probably a more positive one um but it also I'll just get into it, but the majority of my situations in hockey were when I was younger, I'd say probably between the ages of 8 and maybe 14. I feel like maybe uh, a little less mature as far as the kids on the ice. It was never really kids on my team, it was always kids on the other team. Uh, whether it was telling you, why aren't you playing basketball or you should be playing football when you know anybody can play hockey, it doesn't matter. 
you know, what your color is. But I remember we were in a, we were in a game and lined up against a guy, and he used the N-word, called me N-word, and obviously I went back to the bench and I was clearly frustrated, pretty sure I had tears in my eyes, like I was mad, I was sad, I had a whole mixed range of emotions, and my coach was also, he was white, I was the only black guy on the team at the time, but you know, he looked at me and asked what was wrong, because he could tell that just wasn't normal, and he looked at me and you know, I told him what had happened, he called the timeout, called the ref over, and the ref's like, well, there's nothing I can do. I didn't hear it, I didn't, he's like, I couldn't hear it. If I didn't hear him say it, there's nothing I can do. And he said, well, if you're not gonna give the guy a penalty or kick him out of the game, we're leaving. And I think that was kind of the moment for me that realized like this sport is for me, that I have that sort of backing. And my coach, our team, we left the game, we lost the game, we forfeited the game. Uh, because the player on the other team had used that word against me and the ref obviously said he didn't hear it so he can't do anything. So for me that was kind of an empowering moment for myself to be able to know that you know those guys had my back and also that this sport you know is for me to play as well. And I think that kind of pushes me to do the same thing and to show you know young kids of non-white uh, backgrounds that they can play this game or to show that somebody like them is making it to the highest level. Uh, thanks. Um, there were several things that really resonated um, with me. I mean, uh, I'm older than all of you. Uh, and um, uh, just some of the stories sound really familiar. One of the things that I heard there's a theme, not with everyone, because you're in different stages of your life, but there was this point at which you were no longer able to do, for some reason, you were dismissed or ended or injured or something, and you weren't doing anymore. And there's a sense of like relief, like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I remember when I got cut from uh, my college team when I was a sophomore, you know, I, I, sort of, like, I had this big, like, oh, I don't have to. I don't have to pee in this anymore. Um, now I don't know if anyone wants to comment more about that, but um. or maybe I just did. <laughs> but you, you felt really easy not to have to do. Yes, uh, just at that point. So, and I think this is a common theme that when you no longer are in it, you can look down and see what it really is. So those instances or culture of dis discrimination or bias or how, how much you had to you know, mentally be in that space to perform. Um, I remember uh, one game in particular, it was probably uh, one of the roughest games that we ever had. Um, and I was, I had a great game. I was a goalie, I had a great game. At least that's what they told me. Um, the game ended in a tie. We were in Litchfield, Minnesota. And the crowd was pretty raucous. Uh, but it wasn't until after the game that my teammates told me the things they were saying in the stands. And they said, oh, that was a rough crowd, but did you hear what they were saying to Clarence? And I, and I know, Stephen, I think you were the first person to mention this. It's like, you know, you're just there to, to perform you're going to do your thing because I mean I I loved hockey that was my best sport um, but you know it's like there's this point at which you, you just you don't hear it I mean you sort of get blinded by sort of that physical activity which in itself is a defense against that but also you know the survival thing and also you're doing something that you love I mean I love skating I love one point I love hockey. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. You're basically asking the, the sense of relief after he decided to quit the sport or whatever, right? Yeah, or, or transitioned into doing something else or getting okay. into something that is more healthy like what you're trying to create here. Okay, well for me, um, I quit ballet. Um, I've been doing it my whole life and um, it was a sense of relief that I quit 
not because of the dim discrimination, like I was already prepared for that, but mostly because ballet is a hard sport and it takes a lot of mental ability, like you have to love it. I love dancing, but going to a ballet company, learning 10 ballets a week, you get bored. I mean, ballet is kind of boring. Like I can't watch a ballet, like I go to sleep every time. Just saying. Um, the training is already big, like really intense, but being um, black and like I have a lot of, there's a lot of black male dancers that it's like, uh, it's like the new end. Like everybody wants to hire a black dancer now. But the problem with it is, is that you always have to be good and you already have to be good in ballet. So always being like that is just like hard. And in skating, I don't have to be like that. So um, I quit when I was, um, like officially I quit when I was 19, then I switched over to skating. Um, I danced in Russia at Bolshoi Ballet, so that was also like, for two weeks my name was Monkey. So, um, you know, you just deal with things like that. But it definitely is a sense of relief that I got to create. I still have friends that dance, you know, do their little thing, they twirl, they love it. Um, but I'm like, thank God I don't have to do it anymore. I still love it, but I don't have to try to be perfect anymore. I was, uh, and I'm still traumatized by what I went through um, with competitive skating. I come back to competitive skating because doing skating for leisure is very different. You don't have the expectation. Uh, you do maybe some competitions, you know, you go in front of judges. Um, to understand, I think, my trauma was to stop this competitive activity and take a look back and be like, wow, it's a crazy world. Like, and you know, like, you're hypnotized. You, you, you just grow in that culture, you know? It's like gardening, like, they shape you. They shape the, like, it shaped the way I thought, I think. Um, it was always competition, you know, like, never association. It's like, raised to think that there is a first, a second, and a third, and then the rest. And if I'm not first, it means I'm a loser. So it's super, it's not healthy as a, you know, if a whole community is raised like this, it's like, it's crazy. So like. Stopping this and, and striving for something different really like relieved me from it. But I still feel like the, the weight of, of this conditioning now, even in my um, artistic practice and the new style of skating I, I develop. So I think the hard thing is to uh, understand what happened and then to sublimate it, uh, to move on to something else because you might be quitting something and being eaten from the inside all your life because of some conditioning and it's almost doing a psychotherapy. Uh, what I do now is a psychotherapy with movement, really. So yeah, that's how I relate to, to, to what you say. Okay, uh, Mark, you brought that up. <clears throat> My story is that I didn't quit, like I didn't leave because, um, you know, I'm. I was at the end of my career, you know, I wasn't in love. Um, but I always said, it's gonna be on my terms. Because right. I mean, I the right so the brakes fall off. That's, that was my thing. <laughs> and you know, being on tour and stuff, and you would you'd see your friends and stuff that were still on tour, and they would just be like, you're still doing this? I'm like, yeah. And I knew they were envious of me. Because I knew they wanted to do it, still do it. And I was like, I don't want to be sad. So I'm gonna do it till the brakes fall off. I'm gonna, you know, keep doing um it really wasn't my choice and so when that stuff happened to me it really messed with my head because i didn't get to make that decision it was taken from me and just like recently like and now i'm on this journey trying to find that love again and make it right with me by doing like things like this because i didn't really choose that someone took it away from me so yeah, I'm just, yeah. that's it's, it's been a long journey, but that's why I'm doing this. Oh, oh, oh. I'll just say uh, real quick. I just wanted to. Um,
comment on something, Semelhi, that she said um, regarding this kind of hypnotism or our brainwash. I mean, I think I remember growing up and my entire sense of self-worth value was wrapped up in, in what jump I could land. Um, and so, and, and it really, and I remember I went through a period of, of just confusion and loneliness and sadness after I injured my knee because I was like, oh my, who am I? If, I? if I'm not out there, you know, landing triple south cows, what value do I have? So um, I was no. just, yes, exactly, exactly. And it was amazing, like, what my saving grace was realizing that there was a world outside of the competitive skating world and, and being able to have these experiences with Penumbra and Pangea and, and um, in Philly. Um, and, and that, as everybody, as, well, as, as you guys um, have um, reflected, like having that moment of being able to step back and really reflect and see that, oh, this competitive skating thing is such a minuscule little toxic kernel of a speck of a whatever in the grand scheme of things. And um, I, I, I Samarie, I, I completely agree with you. I would not, if I had a child, they would not be in competitive skating, <laughs> not by any means. So, um, you know. But it's very interesting yeah. because, for example, for a he started way older. He was already mentally constructed, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but that's, that's super. That's super important because he was not a kid, you know. Like, and for lots of us. Like, we were kids, so like super malleable psychologically. Uh, so it's, I think this is super interesting to have your point of view about it because it's, you know, like you don't approach it at all like maybe Denine and I or, you know, like Steven or the rest of us. So, yeah, I think it has something to do with uh, at what age you, you, you get in that. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, you're good. Oh. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that, and, and, and I guess like this is like, in regards to all the worlds that like I sort of like have myself in, um, I really had this question, and, and, and it popped up very recently, of who my audience is and, and who am I performing for um, with everything that I do. Um, so I decided to, I guess, just make this transition completely of like, you know, transitioning my thought of who I thought I wanted to be um, so I felt like I was like constantly performing like not even on the ice or like in tech world or anything like I felt like I was putting on this co consistent performance um, for society um, to accept me so now I'm sort of trying to like deconstruct that like I'm trying to take that apart and say like no like you know I don't have to perform for all of these people like I can I can be fully who I am and be proud of that, and I can have my, I can have my audience be my community. You know, like my audience doesn't have to be um, all of these. I guess like all these white people. Like I don't, I don't need that. Like so, and and, it, and it's not helpful for me. Like, um, well, I mean, I guess like capital wise, but like other than that, like. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm just saying, like, um, applying for grants and stuff, like, you know, who controls the grants? Who controls, like, you know, most of the capital in this country? You know, like, of course, you have to be aware of that. However, like, I just, I don't, I don't want, I want my audience to be my community. I want it to be um, for, my, for my people. And that's what I want to make work for whether it's on the ice, off the ice, whether it's, you know, uh, like for the past actually four years, uh, I was working for a figure skating in Harlem. So I was a coach there. Um, then I directed the program there. So that was, I guess, where I really became, I guess, drawn to and, and in love with my community. Because um, those girls in Harlem, they, they have my heart. And like, so yeah, that's all I have to say.
I was just going to comment again on the like being younger versus like your mental state when these things happen. Like if it happened now, no one's going to be able to. I feel like I'm grown. You can say what you want to me, and it's not going to affect me the way it did when I was 10 and I had that same situation. And I just kind of look back at how many young kids would have quit in that exact same situation because they didn't have the coach that I had, and. That's where the trouble lies. But for me, I mean, I'm thankful that I had the coach that I did growing up and he was able to, you know, show that this game is for me or I probably would have quit too. So I know we're getting late, but I want to give a chance for folks to ask a question if they really have a burning question. Oh. Well, it's not working, but I mean, I'm, asking. I'm just really inspired by you right there, so I'm just going to say it anyway. Um, so, I have my daughter here with me, I'm really kind of excited that she's here because we live in Northfield and I don't know how many have been in Northfield, Minnesota. It is a, uh, it's an adventure in white progressive racism uh, in itself and so I'm really excited that, that she's here. But I also see another chocolate mama over there. So, I was curious and I'll ask you this again on Thursday, the next time we meet after performance. I'm so excited to chat with you. Um, but if you had an opportunity to um, see yourself uh, when you were younger as othered. So when you saw yourself as a skater and you recognized or someone made it apparent to you that you were othered, what would you tell yourself then? Thank you. Ooh, girl. That's a good question. So if I see myself as othered as a kid, what would I tell myself? Um, I still see myself as other. But um, what I tell myself is, this is a great opportunity for me to show them what I can do. Um, so for me, I think um, even when I was younger, I still see myself as other because I was the only male, for one, in my ballet class, ballet class, and for two, I was the only black male in my ballet class. So. Um, what I tell myself is, well, my mom always told me when I was younger that you're a black man in America and you always gotta be on point. So um, every time I step in the light, I'm gonna be on point. So what I used to tell myself is, this is your moment and don't fuck it up. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, that's children. <laughs> Okay, for my Christmas at. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to answer? Yes. My name is my name is Katie, and this is my daughter Kayla. 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 And Kayla will be in her sixth season of hockey. When when she, I'm a single mother and I'm raising her with my mother. And when she was five, she said her dream was to play hockey. When she was four, she said her dream was to play hockey. And I was like, wow, I played for the WPFL for the Vixens. So I played football, and I grew up with big brothers who played football, so I never knew nothing about hockey. And to tell you the truth, I quit watching hockey when the North Stars left. I was kind of hurt. <laughs> so I kind of quit. But um, her first season, she went from a mini mite to the U8 girls team in the same season. And now the position she's chosen is goalie. So, yes, so, um, she's really good as a forward. They would like her to stay as a forward, but her dream is to be goalie, and I support her with that. And also, in Minnesota, it is easier, I feel, to start with hockey because they have try hockey for free. For, so for the first season, they'll give you all your pads, all your gear, and your first season is free because they want to invite more people from the inner city into a not so acceptive sport. And I say that because I've had friends, I'm 40 years old, who say, why do you have your daughter in a white sport? Now, and I will say, it's only, a sport is only what you make it by your mind. So generation, generationally, things are not taught down in a, in a black family to play hockey because uncles didn't play hockey and brothers didn't play hockey. It comes to find out, I found out on her father's side that they play hockey in Texas 
professionals. So it is in the blood. But so all I want to say is that if you have um, this dream that you want to do that, I do tell her that she is going to try a little, she's going to have to try a little harder because she's going to have to prove herself for one, because she plays with the boys. And for two, she has to prove that she can hold that position because there's other children who want that position who are predominantly the color for that sport. So I'm trying to teach her acceptance and diversity and at the same time to believe in herself and to follow her dream. Because now she wants to play on the white caps when she grows up. You said you want to play professional hockey. That's the white caps. <laughs> but thank you for this discussion. I wanted her to understand you know that even if people do look at you differently or say different things still do what you feel you should do mm -hmm. yeah. maybe one more i, I want to give um, i mean i have a lot of questions i'll <laughs> hang out for a couple of days <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm making an assumption. Uh, or do you consider yourself biracial? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to know in particular about your experience, especially within uh, the hockey world, because um, I can guess that you probably feel connected to a uh, black community, but also biracial, multiracial people have a very unique experience that is. Again, sometimes you can connect to black communities, but also that you've had a different experience as well. So I wanted to ask you about that in particular within hockey and if there are other um, biracial people within hockey as well. Yeah, I would say it's, it's definitely different being uh, biracial, even just from growing up uh, having my dad black and my mom white. So just being immersed into both cultures at the same time um, I think that's, I don't know, for me, I, I liked it. I think it's made me a, who I am today, and you know, you just have to embrace it. But as far as hockey's concerned, I think no matter what, you're still black, whether you're biracial or not. I don't think that it's, hey, what, you're, not, you're not white, that's what, first and foremost. But um, that's where it makes it harder to, even though everybody in the locker room is white and you may have part of your family or part of your side comes from there, but you're still, the black guy on the team, regardless of whether my half of my family is white or not. So I think that's the biggest takeaway from that. But I think for me personally, I think it's good because I do have the background of both sides of uh, the equation there. Perfect. Thank you. Well, um, thanks everyone for coming and joining this conversation. Um, Oh, I am told that there are brown body pins for sale for five dollars. So I, I think there's a table back there. Um, and uh, just, I want to say something. That I think Denise wants to say something similar. I remind you, there are a lot of things happening here, a lot of conversations um, that happen here with interesting folks like these. Uh, so remember to sign the guest book. We'd love it if you came back. And. Janine needs to have a microphone to remind you about some other stuff. You can use two. Yeah, yeah, real quick. A, a quick reminder, as mentioned, we do have a lot going on this week, tomorrow. Definitely uh, come check us out at Tria Rink from 6 to 8. It's our donation-based Learn to Skate. Uh, we are actually going to be performing a short um, snippet of the work that we'll be presenting this Thursday and Friday. So if you can't make it, or excuse me, Thursday and Saturday. <coughs> uh, so if you can't make it then, uh, definitely come tomorrow. Uh, we'll probably be presenting that snippet um, around 6.45. Um, and then, you know, join us. Join us um, Friday, this this Thursday and Saturday. I don't know why I keep on wanting to say Friday. Um, Thursday is gonna be at Breck Anderson Ice Arena. Um, in addition, of course, Le Patelli is going to be um, presenting work. 
We have really wonderful food for purchase from Pimento Jamaican Kitchen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so please do come on by. Um, you know, as mentioned, tickets can be uh, reserved for the brown body portion and, and purchased for the lip and hand leaf portion on the Walker website at, as well as uh, brownbody.org. Um, we're very fortunate to be able to offer um, our portion for free. Um, so please do, uh, we'd love to have you there. And then on Saturday, again, same setup, it's gonna be at Highland Ice Arena, right on um, Snelling and Ford Parkway. Yeah. Five o'clock for Brown Bodies portion, and please do not ask me to say the times for the Three and seven. Three and seven, thank you. Too many things in my brain, thank you.